So I'm Tammy Newbury and I'm the Director of Brookings Museum. Um, I want to just take the opportunity to thank my team for the amazing day that they put on for you all today. Um, I, I can't believe how much hard work has gone into it, but it's wonderful seeing it all come together. Um, the morning part of today was about looking back at the centenary of that amazing land speed record that was set here at Brooklands 100 years ago, the last time that a world record was broken here at, uh, on the Brooklands site. But Brooklands Museum's vision is about inspiring people to shape the future through Brooklands' history of innovation and endeavour. And for us, looking forwards is just as important as looking back. The stories about what happened at Brooklands are hugely inspiring, but unless you can connect that with what that might mean for you in the future, it's only just a story from the past. And so what we really try and do here is to use the stories of what happened in the past and draw the connections between the kinds of people that made things happen here that had never happened in the world before, that broke records, that won races, that designed aircraft, that uh, did things that people had never done before, and connect that up with the opportunities there are, especially in careers in STEM subjects, so in science, technology, engineering and maths to do that in the future. And this panel is partly about sharing some of those opportunities. And the other side of that wall, um, which you can get to by going round, we have an exhibition uh, which we put on with McLaren Automotive, which is exactly about that. It's called Driven by Design. And it's about the people as much as the cars, because cars don't design themselves. They don't exist unless people design them and build them. And, and that's true for everything on this site. Um, and whilst the things that have happened here have happened, new records are always being set. There are always new opportunities to break new boundaries. If the world is going to have a future in the climate emergency that we have, new technology, new engineering, new science is a vital part of that. And we want to inspire everybody and anybody to feel that those are careers that they can take up. So today we're launching the Brooklands Innovation Academy, which is one of the ways in which we're going to be doing this in the future. And the Brooklands Innovation Academy is a partnership that we are doing with uh, Professor Brian Cox, him off the telly, which he doesn't like me saying it like that, um, and Lord Andrew Mawson and Well North Enterprises and Bourne Education Trust, who are a chain of um, school ac academy chain schools in this area. Um, and we're working together with businesses like McLaren, who are one of our supporters, um, and GlaxoSmithKline, to really give young people an opportunity to understand that when you have a career in science and engineering, it isn't like sitting in a science lesson for the rest of your life, that it is all about problem solving, about innovation, about the entrepreneurship, and about the human qualities that go into being successful in that. Um, and we'll be working with a series of programs throughout the year, giving the young people an opportunity to explore those kinds of elements of both science and engineering, but also of the qualities that it takes to work as a team to achieve those things. And then in the, towards the end of the year, we have a big celebration event where Brian Cox will be hosting a whole range of different speakers, and we'll have 400 young people here in able to talk about uh, what careers in STEM could be for them. Thank you again all for coming and I'll hand over to Johnny. Thank you, Pamela. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I'm incredibly proud here to be uh, to be hosting this panel today. Um, and as Tommy said, we've got a bit of a running order. Um, we've got a, a competition to uh, to judge, and then we'll uh, we'll move on to your questions. Um, but first, I'm going to start with, uh, with with a couple of introductions. So I'm Johnny Swinnell from McLaren Automotive. I'm a vehicle program manager, and I was uh, responsible for the uh, for the set of GTR, which you'll see next door if you go and take a look at the uh, the, the exhibition later on. Um, Don, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Don Wales. Um, I suppose I'm. Um, best known as being sort of grandson of Sir Martin Campbell, nephew of Don Campbell, who broke numerous records. Uh, I've broken a few sort of class records uh, for the electric car. Uh, I hold the world record for a steam-powered car. 
but I also broke a record for a lawnmower, which I know is going to uh, amuse one of the schools. Uh, that really was a cut above the rest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I am a living as a photographer, so um, that's that's me pretty much. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Andy Green. Um, my day job has been as a fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force, and my holiday job has been uh, driving world line speed record cars. Um, I was lucky enough to drive the thrust supersonic car. We still hold the outright world land speed record at 763 miles an hour. Um, longest standing record in history, which is a measure of how difficult it is, and a real, real annoyance to the Americans, so it's worth doing just for that. I um, was lucky enough to drive the world's fastest diesel car, the JCB Diesel Max, which is, again, showcasing what you can do with really good basic technology of something like a digger engine, or in this case, two digger engines in close formation, 350 miles an hour at multiple salt flats, and most lately working on the Bloodhound land speed record project um, about trying to see if it's possible to get to 1,000 miles an hour, and using that adventure to promote science and technology globally, just the way that Tamalu was describing earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is David Thurton. I'm a mechanical engineer at an electric startup company based in England called McMurtry Automotive. We've got a very exciting small little electric car um, and our aim is to make it the fastest track car in the world. So it's not on the same ballpark as these guys doing hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour, but um, doing corners and going around Silverstone is, is what we enjoy to do. Uh, and I hope um, yeah, being here today can answer some of your questions about getting involved in uh, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering as a potential future career. Thank you. So, the pursuit of speed is a kind of really broad umbrella. Um, what we do in Formula One in the Taran is very different to what we do in the automotive side of the business, and that's very different to what these guys do. Um, but what links us all, and links us to, uh, to, to Brooklyn, as Tony said, is the, um, the, the spirit in which we do it, the, uh, the methodology that we use, that, uh, that spirit of innovation, the one of uh, pursuing um, the ultimate goal and, uh, and never giving up. And that's something that was, uh, that was really obvious to us in, uh, in the, uh, when we were judging these, uh, the, these cars, the, the effort and the thought process, the iterations that have gone into them um, have been very, very impressive. And the enthusiasm from the students really, really stood out. Um, we have been uh, been given the, uh, the, the the overall speeds, and what I would say is that um, that the range of speeds. Um, covered by the class is very very tight, and um, so there's only one mile an hour across all of the uh, all of the entries. Um, and the, uh, the the winner will be the, uh, the 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 fastest car. But I think we'd like to make some comments on some of the designs uh, before we get there. Don, what 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 were your, what were your thoughts? Um, well, I, I, I totally agree with the, the comments about the, the enthusiasm uh, chatting to all the, all the students was um, uh, amazing. Talking to you all, I could see the, the sort of um, enthusiasm in your eyes. Um, some of you were asking us questions um, and your determination to overcome the problems that um, you discovered when you were doing your, building your vehicles. Um, just showed that if you put your mind to something and you want to overcome it, then just determination and keep going is, is by far the best thing. Uh, the, the vehicles were um, very varied that we had before us. Um, and one of the comments I wanted to make was that uh, you had a very wide track to uh, play with, but you all went over the same bumpy bit, of course. Uh, every one of you hit the same bump and all took off. Um, I was hoping that one of you might notice that the runway was a little bit smoother on one side. I know Brooklyn's isn't smooth anymore, not that it ever was in its day. Um, so that was just one thing you should look at, is trying to think slightly sideways, literally, um, and think differently, and go differently. Um, my project, the, the steam car, uh, was started actually at Southampton University, which you guys might well know. Um, and it was started by an undergraduate who thought, let's have a bit of fun with something, and let's do something no one else has done, and that's a steam car. And he spent his um, time at Southampton University developing a steam car, realizing that it's actually quite difficult, but persevered with it. Um, and then when he, he graduated and moved on, he then did something less complicated, like quantum physics or something, I don't, I'm not sure what. Um, but then that project then carried on 
um, as a, a private investor took over. But it started with an undergraduate, and it then went on to break a world record. And if you guys, at a young age, can think of something that you want to do, and you've got to have the passion and the belief and take it forward, that your little seed eventually could develop into something really major. That took 10 years just to speak up. And I think you guys have had a small taste of that with your projects. And I applaud you for, for doing these today and coming here and performing in front of the public. But just think sideways and think about what you want to do. And whatever walk of life you move into, you've got to enjoy it. And I know we discussed that um, with one of the teams as well. But um, I know I've got a couple of favourites. Um, but I'll, I'll hand you back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the, the entry that, um, that really struck us as being... Um, as displaying the like kind of engineering innovation that uh, that, um, that captured my interest anyway um, was one where the, the the team could very successfully articulate um, their process for developing the car. They tried a couple of things; it didn't work. They tried again, um, and that happened two or three times. Were able to uh, to distribute mass around the car to try and make it more stable. That kind of thing. There was a, a huge amount of learning that went into the process, and very much learning by doing. It's a great example of the engineering process that we use. Um, and uh, and yes, yeah, so with a uh, with a winning speed of hang on, I'll just get, oh, I've just scrolled right to the end. <laughs> with a winning speed of seven point seven miles an hour, it was uh, the Jubilee School. Uh, it was very, very good, and as, uh, as I say, the, the, the story of, um, of your approach, and this was common across all of the entries, but the story of the approach, of, um, we tried something, we, um, we, we learned from that, we, uh, we tried something new and, uh, and developed the design, is exactly the design process that, um, that, that, that we use in the plan. Congratulations, well done. If so, I can if I add, add a few comments myself, um, uh, they, they, they've all got... Um, their own attributes, but there's, there's two in particular that, that, that I wanted to comment on, uh, and this is the Applemore car. Um, one of the comments they said to me was, um, I said, why did you paint it black? And they said, uh, well, it's because that's the only paint we had available. Now, that's exactly the sort of um, ethos that the Bluebirds were painted. My uncle and my grandfather came up with this idea, what my grandfather did, of having a car and painting it blue. And I'm often asked, well, what is blue by blue? Well, it was whatever tin of blue paint you could find. So you guys with your black paint, that's what's available. So that was, that was brilliant. Um, and then uh, Jubilee um, with your, your blue car as well. So um, yeah, get my vote for that one as well. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So um, with that, we'll move on to um, to some questions. I think, if we uh, if we may, um, and we are here at, uh, at Brooklyn's and uh, an amazing sunny day outside. Um, this is the uh, the HQ of Sir, Ma uh, Sir Malcolm Campbell, and, uh, and as Tommy said, where where the um, the land speed record was set a hundred years ago. Um, so our first question really is about Brooklyn's and uh, and, and Dom. What does uh, what does Brooklyn's mean to you? Oh crikey. Um... <laughs> Well, I mean, Brooklyn to me is uh, uh, what it is now. It's just a fabulous place. You know, it's so steeped um, in history. You can't fail but to be absorbed by it. But from from my personal point of view, it's obviously um, arguably where um, my grandfather made his name. So Malcolm Campbell raced here, and uh, he had a, a series of nicknames for all of his cars. I think that's what it was fairly common in those days. Uh, and these cars just didn't give him the success that he, he craved for. And this is going back to sort of 1910, 11 and 12. Uh, and then one day he was watching a play called The Blue Bird of Happiness. Uh, and this was a play that um, was in London. It's a, a fairy story about some kids trying to find this bird of happiness. And it's always just out of their reach. Um, and again, it's a, it's a story about um, trying to improve yourself through life, looking for this happiness, and eventually you realise that the happiness is within you, and it's up to you to bring that out and, and to enjoy life and to, to better yourself as you go along. So Grandfather was so taken by this play that he thought, well, I'm going to call my car Bluebird. And he, on the way home late at night, he woke up the local ironmonger 
bought every tin of blue paint that just happened to be there. And the next day, uh, well, he painted the car blue that night, and the next day he drove it to Brooklyn's here and wrote Bluebird on the side of it and won his first race. So from that moment onwards, everything was Bluebird. Um, so that's where um, my grandfather started, and then from that, uh, he wanted to be the fastest man alive, um, and he then eventually acquired the Sunbeam that we've all been celebrating today, uh, and became the first man to do 150, and then went on to do 300 miles an hour. But without Brooklands, I doubt that would have happened. Um, Brooklyn being the centre of motoring in its day, it was the sort of the centre of excellence. It attracted all of the designers, all of the technology of the day, um, and my grandfather recognised that. He capitalised on it um, and, and sort of honed his, his driving skills here. So to me, Brooklyn is the birthplace of my family's achievements. It's an incredible story. Ernie, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, great question. Um, actually, my story will start even before that. Um, Brooklyn, to me, is a reminder that if you're going to have a dinner party, be very careful how much you have to drink. <laughs> 1906, Hugh Long King, owner of this whole estate, had a dinner party, and at that dinner party, having had possibly one too many drinks, um, took a bet that he could build the world's first purpose-built racetrack right here. Then contacted his, uh, his good friend Colonel Holden from the Royal Artillery, who built it for him. And the following year, 1907, it was open. Now, Colonel Holden did the classic MOB thing, over spec, overpriced, uh, but he did actually get it built. And it was terribly bumpy. Not just now, it's always been bumpy. But nonetheless, as Don's just uh, so expertly explained, it was the world's first purpose-built banked racetrack and attracted all of that expertise. The tyre manufacturers, the engine manufacturers, the chassis, the drivers, everybody wanted to come to Brooklands. This was the place where the technology happened. 11 years after it opened, the First World War finished, and at that point, this was also the largest aircraft manufacturing plant in Britain, one of the largest in Europe, with all of the expertise, for the lightweight aero engines, the lightweight structures for aeroplanes, and critically, wind tunnel technology. Because if you want to go really fast, it's not just about having a big engine and being able to handle it. It's also, as you guys have found out, it's also about the aerodynamics, the bodywork, and the drag. And you know, Mal Malcolm Campbell's name, as far as we know, is the first one associated with wind tunnel testing of high-speed straight-line cars. And that was discovered in the archives here at Brooklands. That is why, since the 1920s, the British have totally dominated the world landspeed record for the last 100 years. We've done more of that than every other nation put together. As I said, that really annoys the Americans, so it's worth it just for that. But more importantly, it's about demonstrating that sheer global expertise and excellence. And you can trace that outwards through the rest of motorsport, starting from here to ultimately, you know, where is Formula One based? And it's in the Vale of Oxford. You know, the gentleman on my left, they sit here representing the, the world's best automotive and autosport expertise. Their sport, Formula One, yes, I know it's only small, slow cars that go round and round in circles, <laughs> but they are the best in the world at, sorry, I couldn't resist, but they are the best in the world at what they do. And why does Britain have that expertise? Because of this place. Because Brooklands, before it was anything else, is what we would now call the world's very first and very best automotive, autosport and aerospace industry centre of excellence. That's what happened here, and we still, 100 plus years later, are reaping the benefits of it through great British teams like McLaren and all of the other expertise, which is globally recognised, and it's a multi-billion pound business for this country. So thank you, Brooklyn. I completely agree. The, um, the first... I um, thought you might. Yeah. <laughs> um, the first, uh, first Formula British Grand Prix was, uh, was, was here. Um, the, the, this is the genesis of, uh, of most motorsport in the UK, and uh, the whole industry has grown up from there. Um, and, and like I say, we are the world leaders. Um, Formula One teams are all based in, uh, in, in the UK, with one or two notable exceptions, but uh, yes, yeah, almost exclusively. 
David, what are, what are your thoughts? So it's my first time visiting Brooklyn's today, and I think my impression is bold, British, and banking. Um, so looking around the museums earlier, there's a fantastic picture of uh, John Cobb with his wheels off the ground, setting the record in the silver Napier Railton. And you think, imagine Lewis Hamilton doing a record with his Mercedes jumping through the air. Like that is something that is really, really um, different uh, and pioneering and brave. Um, the Britishness sinks through in the cars that have been built here, run here, set records with uh, iconic families. Um, and yeah, motorsport is something close to my heart because it's the reason I got into engineering in the first place. So I used to do go-kart racing at my local track and that led on to doing an engineering degree, uh, working in Formula One and now working for an electric car company. Um, so yeah, the emotions of preparing a car, um, getting your friends to help out, finding a little bit of budget, um, having engines blow up. Uh, I, I can imagine all these things happened 100 years ago um, and it would have been great to have seen that. Um, and, then, and then the banking. So I think some people here might be um, Formula One fans. You've got the banking at Brooklyn, some of the first yeah, British Grand Prix was held, but there's banking all over the world that's really famous that pushes cars to the limit. You've got um, a track in Italy called Monza, which has some famous old banking. You have a track in America called Indianapolis, um, where there's cars racing at 240 miles an hour still to this day. Um, and um, yeah, so using that experience from the modern day and then casting it back 100 years ago, you just think, crikey, we've got it fairly easy nowadays with uh, <laughs> everything we've got. You raise a really good point um, around the kind of the, the safety elements, and Lewis Hamilton wouldn't be allowed to make jumps in his Formula One car and that kind of thing. It, it is a. I've seen the Mercedes. It is jumping this season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true, true. Um, but, yeah, but, uh, not necessarily by design, shall we say? Um, um, and but I think it, it is a really good point that um, that historically and, um, and and now um, as we move forward there's a, there's a much greater increase on safety uh, in focus on safety um, the speed limits on all the roads that have changed for hundreds of years it does beg the question what what's the point of a um, of a uh, of a speed limit record what, what of a speed record what, why do we do it and go for it yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, for, firstly, it's got nothing to do with uh, you know with going faster on the roads. Um, you know, to use Bloodhound as an example, uh, and something that some of you may have heard me say before. You know, trying to build a thousand mile an hour car has got nothing to do with you being able to do the school run at supersonic speeds in the future or getting your shopping at a thousand miles an hour. That's not what record breaking is about. That said, just as with uh, you know, you are never going to, uh, to go on holiday in a Formula One car. That's not what your technology is about. But the benefit of developing that technology and the spin-offs from not just the technology you get from it, but understanding, in a lot of ways, how to use existing technology better, more efficient, more cleverly, um, benefits all of those individuals and all of those organisations that are involved. And for any large record-breaking project, they don't just go into the dozens, they go into the hundreds of companies. Yeah, by the time, to give you an example, by the time we actually launched Bloodhound publicly, way back when, over 10 years ago, um, we reckon that there had been something like uh, the number of people who had been involved in this completely covert secret project that we haven't yet announced to the, uh, to the press. Um, we reckon there had been between 20 and 30,000 people had in some way contributed to the early design and development and, uh, and technology test elements of getting together enough stuff that we could uh, launch the project. That's how complex that kind of level of technology is. But those 20 or 30,000 people and all the organisations, universities, companies, etc., they've got people who are thinking about life now in a different way. And that's got a value all of its own. Yeah, um, and from, from a Formula One perspective, um, we're obviously out there trying to go as fast as we can, and lightweight things is a huge part of that, and uh, and that is technology that trickles down from Formula One into uh, into the the kind of normal automotive environment that is affecting your ability to go shopping and that kind of thing. That um, that increased efficiency in cars and the move to um, to alternative drivetrain technologies, that kind of thing, is driving technologies and it requires technologies that are being developed in these um, in these kind of crucibles of uh, of engineering. Yeah, absolutely, um, and I, I, going back to my grandfather and my uncle's day, um, yes, motor racing has always helped um, everyday motoring, but record breaking has helped that as well. Uh, my grandfather, prior to record breaking, um, he wore a leather flying hat, goals, 
Um, he was partially responsible for uh, inventing the crash helmet, purely for his son Donald, because he said Donald was too clumsy uh, and needed a crash helmet. Um, and he said if Donald goes into record breaking, um, that every likelihood is he'll end up killing himself. So he wanted him to wear a crash helmet. But then when Donald came into record breaking, um, he was, again, partially responsible for promoting seatbelts. And the seatbelt saved his life in 1960 when he had a car crash. So, um, like motorsport, Lansby record breaking has um, contributed to road safety as well. It's a, yeah, an incredible story. And the, the principle of relevance is, um, is, is a big one. And, you know, we are moving towards to drive train technologies, and that, that's happening in the automotive industry. We're now looking at, um, at the internal combustion engine becoming something that we've used previously. We're now looking at electric drivetrains. Um, do you think that, um, that chasing speed limits is relevant in the era of, um, of electric drive trains? David, I'll let you uh, jump in on that. So, interestingly, the first car to ever go over 100 kilometres an hour was actually an electric car back in 1899. So, electric cars have um, been pushing the limits uh, way before these combustion guys came along and <laughs> took, the, took all the glory. Um, I think one of the key things about chasing records, um, it's, it's the learning that the team can get um, by having a really clear focus. Like when you're building a, a record car, you haven't got to worry about putting in air conditioning or a stereo or um, you can really focus on pushing the technology to the absolute limit. Um, and, and when you get a team with a clear goal, you can really, really um, create like a snowball effect of energy uh, and learning and you're kind of thinking 24-7, so you wake up in the middle of the night and you'll be thinking of how you can make your part better. And then that uh, energy like feeds into your teammates and then before you know it, you look back in six months' time and you think, guys, how did we create something as awesome as any of the cars you built or cars that we, got, we, we guys work on? Um, and and maybe you've worked on, on an exciting car and then you'll get another job in another industry and um, cutting edge technology and uh, analysis techniques from uh, record cars could be made to make buses better if you work for a local bus company and uh, all these things uh, all come around in a, in, a, in a full circle and it's amazing the people you meet in the engineering circles because it's a, it's a very tight-knit community and, and um, yeah, everyone helps each other to, to learn every day. Thank you, Don, have you got any, any thoughts on the relevance in the EV world? Um, well, yes. I mean, I, I started promoting electric vehicles back in the mid 1990s, um, and I can remember we had a, a display at the Auto Sport Show, and we were the only car that was electric on in the whole hall at Auto Sport in Birmingham. Massive show, and people were coming up to us and saying. Uh, an electric car. Why, why, why are you promoting an electric car? It, it won't go very far. It won't be very fast. Um, and we've got enough oil and petrol to last for another 200 years or so. Um, you're sort of barking up the wrong tree. But we did persevere. Um, and um, eventually we got a land speed record. It wasn't as fast as I was hoping for, but it started to promote electric vehicles. Um, I wanted to raise the money, which is something we all mentioned about earlier, um, to, to do a world record attempt. And if I could, I would still do that. I'm not sure um, that an electric car doing four or 500 miles an hour, which is a project I, I still have um, dreams on, is as relevant as trying to get a, a smaller electric car um, that has everyday road usage to promote uh, an electric car. So if sort of an under a thousand kilo class of the car um, would, would be uh, a nice record to go for, which is 250 odd miles an hour, I think now. But that has more relevance to everyday motoring. Um, but land speed records, uh, top speed is the glamour. You know, that's the big headline news. And people like Andy who, who promote that so well. Um, but there are so many classes of records. It's not just electric cars. Electric cars, I think, are uh, the interim fix to our, our issues. And there's technology that we still need to invent. There's hydrogen. Um, and there's probably something else that we've not even got got into yet, which the youngsters today could well be developing in 20, 30 years' time. 
I expect you probably absolutely right. Um, certainly from a um, from a battery electric perspective, the the challenges are, are big, and uh, it's pushing the boundaries of those challenges that um, that happens in these record breaking attempts that um, that really allows us to move forward. Um, but you're right. There's, there's other technologies out there, and, uh, and and many many opportunities to explore those and, and develop them into the cars of tomorrow. Absolutely. I mean, the problem I had. Um, with my car was a bit, couldn't quite get the ethos across to, um, it was a, a university was helping me, um, I'm not going to slag off universities, it's not my job today, but um, I wanted them to push their technology to breaking point, and break it and then fix it, we know then where not to go to next time, um, and I think that's what motorsport is all about, it's pushing those boundaries, it's land through effort, pushing the boundaries right to the very limit, if it breaks, you can fix it, and then you know what your boundary is for the time being. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, developing it. The principle that applies all the way from absolutely remote control cars right yeah. up to, uh, to land speed record. Well, that was demonstrated to us today with these, with these wonderful kids here today. Um, it didn't work the first time, so we, we did it again, and they pushed on, and I think that was just so clear. I agree, I agree. Um, What's really clear about Brooklyn as well, when you wander around the place, um, there's clearly a huge mix of, um, of disciplines here, and we've talked about this kind of cross-discipline that's required to, um, to really launch a, um, a land speed record. But the, um, the industries are, um, are, are, and technologies are moving away from each other. Do you ever think that we'll see the same kind of collaboration across fertilization that, we've, that we saw in, in Brooklyn's in the, in the early years in, uh, in the automotive industry going forward? So looking at some of the cars out there, so they're cars with an engine from an airplane. <laughs> um, and as you're seeing at the moment, now it's electric cars that are happening first before electric planes. So it feels like maybe the automotive industry will have some technology to feed forward to the aerospace industry because they're going to go through a lot more um, design cycles and because automotive is typically design a car between three and five years and a plane might take 10 to 20 years. Um, but an interesting thing to think about with your any electric vehicle, it might not be a car, it could be an electric scooter that you might have at home. And when you think about uh, anything that's powered by electricity, you have to really be really careful how you spend all your electrons. Um, so. The bigger and heavier and um, the more drag your vehicle has, the bigger battery you need. And so that's why you see it's really, really hard to electrify a plane. You can just about electrify a car. But when you've got an e-bike or an e-scooter, they're really well suited because they're very light and very low drag. So you can start to see how different um, power sources can suit different applications. And I think what you'll find with electrification is you have to be really really specific in what you want to do so you can't just have like a seven seater family car for one person to go to work in because you'll be wasting a lot of um, a lot of energy and um, so yeah I think you'll see over the next sort of five ten years um, a lot more specific transport for specific applications um, and uh, yeah for example hopefully e-scooters will be legalized soon and we can all um, keep coming to work on them and save a bit of traffic. I think um, that, that kind of very specific application fits very much into what you're saying, Don, about uh, about pursuing a um, sub thousand kilo, kilo um, electric land speed record because uh, because that's that's where the relevant technology will be developed. So that's the, the kind of thing where we'll be developing technologies that people will see and use rather than uh, than something that uh, that so far out there is very difficult to see. Well, yes, I mean that's that's a project I, I would like to try and expand on. Um, plus the fact that. Um, a 500 mile an hour electric car is possible, but you're going to need 20, 30 million pounds for that. Mm. Whereas um, a sub thousand kilo car, hopefully, is going to be a lot less than that. Yeah, sort of 12 million. Still a lot of money, but you can get a a, um, a motor manufacturer easily involved with that. So yeah, that would be a I think a fun project to be involved with. And again, that's another key issue today. Was whatever you're doing in engineering terms or motorsport or any walk of life is you've got to have fun with it. It's blooming hard work doing these projects as Andy knows as well. Um, but if you're not having any fun, 
Don't do it. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, and that segues beautifully into our, into our next question for you, Andy. Um, you know, these landscape records they occupy a huge amount of time. We've talked about the amount of, the amount of money that they cost and that kind of thing. Um, what, what is it that, uh, that really captures people's imagination, that makes people want to do this? Uh, yeah, good question. But uh, I'm actually just going to step back one and just give you okay. to finish the answer to the previous question, uh, which was uh, about cross fertilisation, which was uh, which was a great example, particularly for you guys in the middle, um, in terms of the getting ideas from other places. We live in a post-COVID world where life for you guys over the last couple of years has been very different, and working life going forwards may look somewhat different. And particularly the concept of how much working from home seems like a good idea. Cross fertilisation is something that happens when you meet somebody who has an answer to a question you haven't thought to ask yet. And you will never meet them if you're working from home. I'll leave you with that as a thought. <laughs> um, back to how to impress people and why they think it might be, uh, you know, record breaking might be um, worth doing. Um, record breaking is about storytelling. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, anybody know who jumped, who was the uh, person to jump out of the highest, uh, do the highest balloon jump ever? There's a guy called, sorry? Baumgartner. Baumgartner and the Red Bull, uh, yeah, so-called space jump, he never went near space, but Red Bull told a really good story there. Do you know about the guy whose name, even I've forgotten now, Paul something or other, who did it the following year, I think, actually it was just a few months later, and jumped 20,000 feet higher? He didn't bother to tell anybody. He didn't bother to get a, uh, a whole team of, and if you saw the, uh, the Red Bull jump and that huge team of guys on laptops, they weren't engineers, they were running PR feeds. That was the, well, they, they looked good, they were all running global PR feeds, which is why they got the, live, the largest live internet audience. And you remember the uh, band on the name, and we all do, because he jumped, basically repeated something that had been done in the 1960s, and another guy did something technically much more impressive. You've never heard of him. It's about storytelling. Um, and if you want to develop new technology, doing a land speed record is not the cheapest way to do it. Because you can develop new technology and then just use it. You don't then have to put it into a land speed record car and then take it to a desert a third of the way around the world and spend a long time out there testing and developing this new prototype vehicle. But if you want to convince people that this technology works and show it to them in an extreme and exciting way, and exciting is really important in this context, then a land speed record becomes very cost effective. But you have to tell that story and get the excitement. If you want to remind not just this country, but the whole world, that Britain is still at the top of the pile for a whole range of engineering uh, expertise and disciplines, from auto sport um, and land speed records through to uh, you know, uh, material science, and a whole range of other stuff that we do better than anybody else in this country. One way to remind them is to build something that will showcase that and go and run it, preferably in somebody else's desert. America's always best in annoys them. Um, but it doesn't actually matter where. Go and run it fast enough, and now you can live stream it to a global audience and excite them right there and then at the time. And also give all of the metrics to your potential sponsors on how successful you're being, and you can showcase that technology and take them through an adventure. And even give you guys way more interesting science lessons than just opening a physics text textbook, because you can actually build cars like this and then test them. Learn by doing. All of that isn't actually record breaking, it's all storytelling. Record breaking is actually what you're telling the story about, but it's the story that counts. And we get to stick it to the Americans. <laughs> So, David, um, a question specifically, specifically to you. Um, your company, McMurtry, they're developing um, the, the next generation of electric sports vehicles. Um, I understand that you have a, um, a, a young team um, over at McMurtry. Um, what would you say about, um, about that team and uh, how they've got involved in the, um, in the development process in, of, your, of your electric vehicle? So yeah, we're really proud to have a, a good, strong graduate intake, and um, these guys are working, and, and they, they come up with ideas that you wouldn't have even thought about. And I guess the key message is like, no idea is, or no question is a stupid question. And um, I think as you go through your career, you, can't, you might get stuck in your ways, and you know we've done things how we've always done. Um, but by having 
people with fresh ideas who have done projects, you know, fairly recently like this, who have got a little snippet of wisdom. And they might not be designing the whole car, but they might be responsible, say, for example, the rear wing, and they've got a really good, um, a really good trip analysis technique they've used, and that's allowed you to unlock some more performance. And then suddenly you get five of these guys all coming up with an idea that gives you 5% performance. And before you know it, you're 25% better than anyone else down the line. So there's definitely a competitive advantage to get from having young, enthusiastic people like you guys getting straight in. And um, if you wanted to, to join any, any British engineering company, I'd, I'd urge you to be really proactive in picking companies that you've got a real nice story in a link behind. <laughs> Um, find, find, do, do your research. Maybe you can find them through uh, through Instagram, um, and 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 suggest the time frame you could be available to come and help them, and, and give them examples of your previous work, and just and just prove your thinking slightly differently to everybody else, um, and that'll get you your first job, and that'll lead to your second job, and your third job. Uh, and then hopefully in, in 10 years time or 20 years time you'll be uh, speaking on a panel like this, eh? <laughs> Um, Don, um, so we've touched very much on, uh, on, your, on your family and family history. Um, they've uh, chased records on, uh, on, on land and, and on water, that's uh, something that we haven't necessarily spoken about. Um, but what are the personal attributes do you think that, uh, that, that are required to go into, into record breaking? Uh, oh, crikey. Well, um, speaking about, about my family, um, I suppose with um, my, my, my grandfather was um, personal attributes. Well, number one, I suppose you've, you've got to have a little bit of money behind you, um, and the grim determination to, to see a project through, absolute belief uh, in, the, in the machine that you're driving um, is prepared um, as best as it can be absolute belief in your team, because without any of these events, um, if you haven't got a good team around you, then you may as well not bother. You know, Andy gets to drive, I get to drive, uh, and you are sort of picked out as the, um, uh, the main focus of attention. But without the guys behind you, it, don't bother. So you've, you've got to have the team. Um, and my grandfather picked a good team. Uh, Donald inherited some of that team. Uh, an immense amount of bravery, especially in those days, and in Andy's case as well, if you're going to do 800 miles an hour, you've got to be brave. You know? And you've got to have absolute belief um, in, in what you're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I am so proud about being a Campbell. Uh, I will defend uh, and talk about them. Uh, they achieved so many different things, not just in record breaking. My grandfather was a very talented man, um, having, some, having some money behind him, but he's, he's also the only person that arguably ended up making money from record breaking and, and motorsport in those days. Um, and he put it to good effects. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's all cost us a lot of money otherwise. Um, but uh, in the case of Donald Campbell, I don't think um, out of a, um, a war situation, uh, and obviously we're in a terrible situation in the Ukraine, but out of a war situation, um, I don't think you'll find a braver man than Donald Campbell. Uh, he knew that when he was driving his car on um, Lake Air, uh, the dried lake bed in, in Australia, uh, that it was a woefully uh, unsuitable surface. Um, and he'd survived the car crash in 1960, which was the world's fastest car crash at the time. Uh, and yet he had to get back into a car and do 400 miles an hour on a surface that was breaking up underneath him. Uh, and he achieved 403 miles an hour with a team um, sort of uh, uh, shocked at how bad the, the, the surface was underneath him. So uh, the attributes of a Campbell certainly then were just uh, immense bravery. Uh, determination to see a job done, uh, very patriotic, supporting Britain, and as Andy said about promoting um, Britain as an engineering base uh, and uh, supporting all of the industries that go into making a record breaking car, tyres, engine, spark plugs, you know, the, the work, it's just um, a big team effort which luckily my, my grandfather, because of Brooklands, was able to capitalise on. 
and it's interesting that you both call out the, um, the, uh, the, the team aspect. And, you know, no one designs a, a car or a, uh, or a land speed uh, attempt on their own. Um, it's, it's a multidisciplinary approach, and, and engineering, innovation, and design covers a huge range of skills um, and, and, and opportunities. Um, for, for people that would want to get into, um, into that, um, what do you think we can recommend to them to do to do next? What 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 should they pursue in order to get into to, uh, pursue a career in engineering? Oh, sorry, that lands me record breaking. Oh no, I'll, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll, 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 I'll cover record yeah, breaking. Let's go with let's go with record breaking. Record breaking first. Absolutely, do not do it. <laughs> Just don't, because if you're the right person to break the record, you'll completely ignore me and do it anyway. <laughs> if you think I'm right, you're not the right person for it. Again, I'll leave that with you. Um, in terms of why would you get into uh, to science and engineering, why would you not? The world is the most extraordinarily enabled place, thanks to modern technology, and it's only going to get better. And that high technology, low carbon, energy efficient world of the future that we all aspire to, we all look forward to, and you guys are going to live in and manufacture and maintain, that belongs to the engineers and the scientists. You can own that, or you can watch it happen. I know where I'd like to be. Terrible timing. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, how, how um, what should the uh, the students pursue in, uh, in order to have a career in engineering or um, land speed record um, breaking? So, for a career in engineering, you might already be doing it. So, whether you're repairing your push bike or you've got a remote control car or you help your dad change the brake list on his Ford Fiesta. Like, they're the only things you can get involved with this weekend and um, getting your hands, you know, oily and. Um, and then happens go together and it doesn't go back together the first time, that doesn't matter. Um, the main thing is get involved and see if it, um, it sparks your interest. Um, and then uh, my experience was to do uh, sci uh, maths and physics uh, at A-level and then apply for a mechanical engineering degree. Um, but there's, there's other ways to go about it. You've got the apprenticeship scheme at Brooklyn. I heard there's 170 apprentices getting trained here um, or out here already. And I think that's actually a really valuable thing because in, in the 21st century, everyone can get really, really good on computers and doing all the theory. But as you see from the guys 100 years ago at Brooklyn's, they were pushing really hard. Their cars were setting on fire. You know, Sometimes parts fell off. Um, and it's about getting stuck in and embracing that. And you know, if, if the wheel falls off, put it back on and, and try again. And if you can demonstrate that kind of attitude in the stuff you do now, that will put you in good stead for every step you try and take um, towards getting your dream job in, in engineering. Well, I, I don't think I can add any more to, to, to what the guys have already said um, and what we've, what we've discussed. It's um, engineering uh, and, and the sciences, uh, as Andy has said, are, the, are definitely the future. The kids here are the future. Um, just believe in yourself. Life is full of knocks. If you, if you get something wrong, as you just said, if the wheel falls off, put it back on again. Um, you only learn from your mistakes and um, that then makes the success even sweeter. So um, stick at it, but above all, enjoy it. You know, you've got to have a passion and a belief um, in yourself and the team that you're with. I think you guys have learned teamwork um, one way or the other. Uh, and, um, and just build on that. And, but above all, enjoy. It's got to be enjoyment. That's the important thing. So just to give you a little bit of, um, of uh, personal history, I, you know, I'm sat here today because I did things like this when, uh, when, when I was at school. I was given this kind of opportunity, and uh, and, and that's what sparked my interest in, um, in in engineering. So your point about uh, maybe you're doing it already. That's uh, that's exactly the right point. Um, this is this is fun. This is exciting. This isn't any different to what I do on a daily basis. It's fun and it's exciting. It's my passion, and I love doing it. Um, um, and uh, and that uh, that is an aspiration. I can't I can't offer you uh, anything more really. Uh, I think we have a question from the audience though. Yeah, it's to do with record breaking, obviously, and technology. And it's really for one end of Andy, if I could. It's um, please cover it. I've always been curious about travelling at seven hundred plus miles per hour. Are you actually following a line on the on the 
uh, on the salt flat, or are you GPS guided, or are you steering the vehicle? I just wondered how that works. Uh, steering down a, uh, a line painted on the desert. Now, again, you know, one, one of the first things we had to do when we started painting lines of the desert was work out what would be uh, you know, entirely environmentally neutral and biodegradable, um, and there are vegetable dyes and various other things. Uh, actually, you know, back in the Thrust Esposito, we went even cheaper. There was a gypsum mine um, in the, the, uh, the nearby town, so we just used uh, uh, gypsum and water. We just mixed it up in a literally a 50 gram gallon drum with a tap hanging off the back, and a bit of carpet around the bottom to spread it out into a nice thick line. It worked perfectly. Um, by the time we given a presentation at the local school, we didn't even get charged for the gypsum. <laughs> so that uh, works up to 700, I mean, uh, if you're targeting 1,000. Same, same idea, but you want the lines to, that, that was a bit however good the driver was on the day. <laughs> Jump forwards to uh, Bloodhound in uh, South Africa, how do you draw a straighter line? Uh, I also do a lot of sailing. Uh, both GPS uh, control autopilots are really good. Now they've got a little bit, but nonetheless, they are, they are pretty good at, uh, at, at holding a uh, heading on flat water. So you should be able to hold a heading, uh, you know, based on the same principles. Vineyards are, have very, very precisely uh, arranged uh, uh, lines of vines uh, at very precise intervals. And that's because before they plant one, they put a very accurate grid of lines uh, across the, uh, the soil. And then at each cross, they put a, uh, a vine plant down. And that grid of lines is put down by a GPS-controlled tractor with a spray head with vegetable dye in it. Now, about 200 kilometres from where the, uh, the desert end is in South Africa, there are a whole bunch of vineyards. So the guy with the tractor drove up and spent three weeks with us just painting vegetable dye lines when we needed them. Absolutely the longest, straightest lines in the history of mankind. Literally a centimetre perfect for 20 kilometres. And that is more than good enough. So would you envisage, if you're targeting a thousand miles per hour, that it would be on an autopilot, or would it be... No, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, the FIA regulations, and, and more widely, they, well, why wouldn't you just automate the car and get out of it? First of all, the FIA regulations uh, require you to do two passes in one hour in a self-powered car, which is wholly and continuously controlled by a driver. Okay. Now, does that allow you to have a bit of active system stability assistance? You know, nobody's pushed, you know, you don't want to push the grey area and then not get the record uh, licence afterwards. Um, the second reason, which is, uh, which is perhaps more important, is that if you're using that active stability system because the car isn't safe to drive without it, what happens when it stops? You know, you have a power interrupt, or you know, has anybody ever managed to run a computer without having the blue screen of death at some stage? You know, it takes on a whole new meaning at a thousand miles an hour. Um, so, yeah, don't be critically dependent on a system if you don't absolutely have to be. Um, frankly, you don't have to be. And the third and most important reason is that this, for the whole team, is a story about human endeavour. It's about how people solve problems. 90%, 95% of the problem solving is done stationary with a car in bits, uh, and that's the stuff that wasn't done on a computer several years ago designing it. But there is a bit of problem solving on the day for the people on the track starting and running uh, and uh, stopping, and the driver in the car. And that, as soon as you automate that and take the driver out, then you finish up with the same sort of environment as would Formula One have the same audience as if you took the drivers out and they were all computer controlled. Would, uh, uh, you know, how many people here watch Formula One? Let's just find out. Yeah, me too. How many people would watch Formula One if there were no drivers in the cars? Uh, no cool. one like, It's called cool. Rubber Race. Uh, give it a shot. Yeah, exactly. Now, I've asked that question to a whole bunch of audiences for the last 10 years. In all of that time, I've had one person say, yeah, I watch. He was the head of automation, automation science at, Mo at uh, Malvern, so he doesn't count. Think about why people in cars is exciting and people not in cars isn't, and you'll have the answer to the question. Thank you very much indeed. So, are there any more questions from the audience? No, what have we got? We've got the If you've got the money, we can start next week. <laughs> uh, we're, we're fundraising post-COVID at the moment. Wish us luck. Good. Any more? No, go for it. Yeah, hi, yeah, I've got a question. It kind of relates to the previous question where you were talking about not leaving any trace with painting a line in the desert. Yet, yeah, all of the cars that we're looking at there are, are beautiful things I work in the museum, so I appreciate that my book is 350 horsepower. But I know that that car burns fuel while there's no tomorrow. 
So is there, looking at what is the future of record breaking, is there a future where a record breaking vehicle could leave no trace? We've got a certificate at home, dated 1997, for the uh, Bureau of Land Management. All these deserts are government owned because nothing grows out there so nobody wants to buy them. So they're all government owned. And they come with rules about looking after them. Actually, it doesn't matter what the rules are. When you go out and run a landscape record car, you must have a perfectly clear track. So you spend weeks with a team, line abreast, walking slowly, picking up even the tiniest bit of debris. And you sweep the track absolutely clear and you run up and down it. We designed the car with catch tanks, so little puffs of fuel and stuff that would go overboard on an aeroplane or go through the engines. We caught everything and we drained it off and uh, put it in a uh, tank and shipped it off the desert uh, you know, once a week as the tank filled up. At the end of uh, six weeks out in the desert, the Bureau of Land Management came out and inspected it and, and actually gave us a certificate of environmental husbandry because we were leaving the desert cleaner than when we arrived. <laughs> That's a negative environmental footprint. That's my vote. <laughs> Thank you. Right, Governor. Another question? Any more? Right, Governor. Yeah, questions to the viewers. And First of all, the big birdie car running a few uh, about a year ago. Firstly, we meet that again this year. Um, and secondly, what's the biggest challenge you've faced since last year? Thank you to our number one fan. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we were really proud to demonstrate our car that looks like a little Batmobile at Goodwood last year. We spent the last 12 months going to some bigger circuits, so we started at Castle Coombe, which is our local track, and then Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, and we recruited a Formula 1 driver as well to help us with our testing, he's called Max. Um, we are going to go to Goodwood again this year. We're going to turn it up to max. We're going to compete in the shootout. Um, we're very excited about that. We're not going to reveal our potential time yet. Um, one of the biggest challenges with our car, it has a, a fan system on it, which basically makes it like an inverse hovercraft. Um, so we can get lots and lots of downforce from zero miles an hour. Um, one of the challenges with that, it rubs against the track slightly. So the challenge is getting a nice consistent level of downforce and a really high number so you can get good cornering speed. So we've been working really, really hard on that. Um, so that's something that hasn't been picked up. So that sort of system was used in Formula One in 1978. Nicky Lauda won a race by an absolute mile and then it got banned. Picking up a technology like that, developing it on an electric car uh, that's capable of over 200 miles an hour is a completely different beast. Um, so that has been a key focus. And there's been lots of stuff that's um, broken, um, but like we've got a really good, motivated team of guys who you know will work through the night if you need to to get the parts done to meet the testing. Um, and it's been a really motivating part of the journey. And when you achieve those targets. Um, it just gets you excited about what might happen at Goodwood this year. See you there. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that fan car, the Gordon Murray design Formula One car, is a really interesting, um, really interesting car. Gordon Murray put the fan on the back, um, and the rules at the time stated that the fan had to be primarily for cooling. So, um, so it's about 51% effective for, for cooling, um, and the rest is all generating downforce. And that actually ties back to, uh, to one, of the, um, one of the cars here, where there's a rule that says, that says how high the cars have to be. So the, uh, the team put a bit of bodywork on to just stuck up to be uh, just, just to meet that rule. And, uh, and, and again, a great example of where, at a micro level, we're replicating exactly the processes that we use in the industry, um, even, even in, the, in, in these cars. So uh, again, you guys have done a phenomenal job. Um, and, uh, and I suppose it just remains for me to, uh, to, to thank the panel um, for, for, for your time and, and for your answers to the questions and, uh, and uh, thank Bookmans for, for, for hosting us this evening in the afternoon. So yeah, and thank you all for, for, for coming to listen to us. Thanks to these gentlemen here for sharing all their uh, experiences and stories with us. It is all about storytelling, isn't it? Um, that's where we get the motivation and the ideas that then takes a lot of hard graft to turn into the actual thing. But it's been fantastic. I've loved the different perspectives. Thank you all for being here and for your time and attention this afternoon. We've got more demonstrations starting out on the finishing straight pretty much now. So uh, if you want to go and catch those, do. And if not, enjoy the rest of your afternoon here at the museum. Thank you. Thank you.